The first time I died was alongside 30 other young adults on the floor of a pharmacy in Nashville, Tennessee. I was 27 years old. Our death was part of a die-in, a strategic action strategy that, in the wake of Michael Brown's death in Ferguson, Missouri, became a hallmark of the movement known as Black Lives Matter. When Mike Brown was killed by a white police officer in Ferguson, it was a catalyzing moment. His body, crucified on an altar of pavement, sat in the sun for four hours, revealing what many oppressed people around the world have always known. Freedom is rarely given freely, and it often requires the blood sacrifice of those bold enough to demand it. Many of the people who joined me that day were friends from my seminary days. You see, the ground we lay upon was not just a pharmacy. It was sacred ground. It was one of the few remaining sites from the 1960 Nashville sit-in movement, a movement that five years before Dr. Martin Luther King marched from Selma to Montgomery, was one of the first sites of nonviolent strategic action being successful in the civil rights movement. Those 20 and 30-somethings in 1960 were, in many ways, the ancestors to our own work. You see, my friends and I, we're the fruit of the labor of social movements that were so hard fought in places like Nashville, in Selma, Alabama, in Bayou La Battery, Alabama, in Greensboro, North Carolina. Even though we've gone very far, we must not confuse progress with victory. You see, in a world where it's still controversial to claim that black lives matter, that women's rights are indeed human rights, and LGBT people deserve basic civil liberties, we still have so far to go. And for us, as young people of faith, it's within those social movement spaces that we've begun to find a sense of hope again. My own story of faith is a long and troubled one. You see, I was born in the quintessential Midwestern town, the type of place where nostalgia runs deep and phrases like, make America great again, are met and embraced. Pickup trucks outnumber cars in grocery store parking lots. The county fair is the hottest thing to do during the summer. And high school basketball season tickets often sell out within the first week. Yet, when my friends and colleagues talk about making America great again, their vision is decidedly monochromatic. My hometown is 95% white and 5% all other. So when people envision a better world, they're not necessarily talking about people who look like me. The first time I was made to feel less than human because of the color of my skin, I was five years old. The year was 1992. A little boy came up behind me on a slide and said, you must be dirty, because why else would your skin be brown? You see, I could see that my skin was indeed brown, and as much as I tried to wash it off, it wouldn't happen. The story I began to tell myself is that there was something fundamentally wrong with who I was. Finding no comfort in school, I ran into the loving arms of Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church a place where every Sunday I saw folks who not only came in brown, 
but all shades of brown, russet, mahogany, dark chocolate. With every note that Sister Oliver played on the organ, with every note that Brother Bumry sang, I knew that there was another truth out there, a truth that said I was beloved in the eyesight of this thing my ancestors called God. I knew in that moment at the altar when I gave my life over to this higher power that I was joining a tradition of other black practitioners of religion who look up to the sky and against the greatest odds saw an image of the divine in which they were truly beloved. Today, I am a clergywoman in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And I have to admit, I'm probably not what you picture when you think of the word reverend. You see, I, I normally wear my clerical collar with skinny jeans. I quote Beyonce lyrics alongside scripture. I'm as at home delivering a sermon on Twitter as I am in a pulpit. Put it short, shortly, I'm a millennial. And a growing body of literature tells us that millennials are less religious than any other generation that's come before. According to the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, young people between the ages of 18 and 35, one third of them identify as none of the above. When asked on surveys, what religious tradition they belong to, they check the box unaffiliated. Yet, the numbers only tell part of the story. You see, these folks aren't just atheists. Two-thirds of them say that they believe in a higher power, some of which they name God, others name it something like love or community. And one in five pray every day. What's true of young folks in this moment is that they feel like religious institutions, as they've been formed, have left them behind. To understand us, and I know a lot of people are trying to understand these millennials, you got to understand our context. You see, we came of age in an era in which, as Stephen Colbert says, was defined by truthiness. An era in which pundits replaced priests and professors as arbiters of truth. September 11th happened my first week of high school. And moving forward, all I knew from what I saw on the television is that religion was the source of deep conflict in our world. And the loudest voices were those in polarized extremes, those declaring that there was a war on Christmas, and new atheists who said that religion poisons everything. It's against that backdrop that many young folks, many millennials, are beginning to explore new forms of community building. New forms of building what some might call church, and others might call a community workspace. You see, we are a generation of young folks for whom our moral and ethical fibers, our very beings, show up in the way that we organize protests, like my friends and I dying on that pharmacy floor, in the way that we build businesses that don't just consider a financial bottom line, but a social good. Millennials aren't seeking to kill or destroy that which came before us. But indeed, to borrow a term from my agricultural friends in the room, to compost. For those unfamiliar with the term, composting is nature's natural way of taking that which is dead and dying and using it to form new life. My friends Casper Turkile and Angie Thurston have begun exploring, two researchers at Harvard, how these new communities are building themselves around the world. In some cases, 
It looks like the dinner party, an international organization of 20 and 30-somethings who've all experienced traumatic loss, usually the death of a loved one. Over dinner, these folks are creating sacred space to share and build community, much the same way that religious institutions have functioned in the past. It looks like the sanctuaries, an art space community in Washington, D.C. that is multiracial and multireligious, that uses poetry and music and indeed improv as a way to advocate for social justice issues and build what they call soulful community. And sometimes it still looks like traditional religious organizations with a new spin, like New City Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota, a church plant that at its core is about environmental justice. These are folks who worship outside. These are folks who see an ethic of love as important as something like advocating on a policy level around climate change. So, no, religion isn't dead. It's just taking new forms. Millennials haven't lost faith. They might not call it God, as I do. They might call it love. They might call it community. They might just call it a higher spirit. So the next time you're with your grandma and she's expressing that palatable panic about the dying churches around her, tell her to look closer. Look at a protest. Look in a coffee shop. Look in a community workspace. She might just find that soulful community that she's been looking for. Thanks so much.